Okay, so what are we seeing here? delay of the video. Oh, I would love more depth too, but we can't do that. I know. We have Yeah, I think you can see the back wall here. Like you sort of briefly get a glimpse of it, but it's it's a smaller effusion, right? So this is certainly not the same size as the other one. So so obviously they come in different shapes and sizes. Um, and you know, this amount of fluid, I would say it certainly looks more generous than you might see with like a viral infection. Um, but this is probably not something that's a hemodynamically significant amount of effusion, right? So um, sometimes you have to sort of explain some of these things you see. If you, the more you ultrasound, if you start seeing some of these kids on your um, scanning shifts who have, uh, you know, viral illnesses and, and whatnot, or, or maybe this is a pericarditis kind of kid, you'll see this kind of amount of fluid. And, and knowing that that exists is important too, because not every pericardial effusion is going to be hemodynamically significant or something that needs to be dealt with, right? So, so discriminating those two is going to be um, something that's clinically relevant. Oh boy, uh, let me go back. Do the atrial sizes look fine to me? Let's see, I wouldn't usually use this view to okay. tell me that, to be honest with you. Um, sorry, let me just play it through. You could be right. I think part of it, the problem is, is that you always see the heart at a bit of an angle in the in the subxiphoid, and so you're you're not really fully cutting through the ventricles as it as it is. So comparing the sizes of the two isn't kind of the goal of this view. Um, so here's another one, which is a bit more of a hemodynamically significant guy. Um, another one where probably peso, if you wanted to, you could definitely argue about having the depth um, altered a little bit. This is. I think a very, very young baby. Um, and again, I think this speaks to the challenges. I think if you look closely enough at this video a few times, you'll see that the right ventricular free wall as well as the right atrium are kind of, you know, collapsing inwards in, a, in an unusual way. However, the baby's heart is going incredibly fast. So you determining that at the bedside is less important than you looking at your patient and kind of being aware of, you know, what's their hemodynamic status. Because if this is a kid that is actively, you know, uh, hypotensive and, and having a really, you know, difficult hemodynamic kind of picture in front of you, this is probably like, you know, think about putting a needle in, right? If that kid looks completely fine and is tolerating it, you have some time. So, so again, the, the appearance on the ultrasound is ultimately helpful, of course, in terms of, you know, determining what's going on with them. But our goal at the bedside is to identify the problem um, and then relate that to the clinical uh, sort of picture of our patient. Um, okay, so this is another kid that is sort of post-op. Um, what do you think about this? More fluid than you like to see? Normal, you think it's normal? Like this is a kid who's had cardiac surgery like a week or two ago. Yep, there's definitely fluid. Well, I mean, it depends, right? If this is a 16 year old kid that, uh, yeah. you know, this is at 22 centimeters here. So this is not your Neo. So a kid whose heart is beating at, you know, 60 or whatever there. Um, I wouldn't say that the contraction from this, you can really give a great kind of determination on. This is not our function view, right? So um, this sub xiphoid is really for fluid. That's the main issue. You know, if this is post-op cardiac, there's a good chance that this is probably normal, right? This is probably expected for this patient's clinical presentation. Uh, I don't know the exact context in this case, but uh, just keep in mind that you can see fluid for a variety of reasons that not all of them are pathological. Um, and so, you know, again, the context of that patient is going to be important. This could also be a kid who's got a viral illness and pericarditis. Um, so... All right, so that's the sub -xiphoid. Next, we're gonna talk about peristernal long. Um, so probe generally in the second to third intercostal space, but really this is one of those things where there is no right or wrong place to be. There's the view you're looking for. Um, so the biggest challenge with cardiac and the reason why it's a bit harder than the other ones in general is that people kind of uh, get fixated on, you know, 
sort of this is the position the probe has to be in when really when you get good at cardiac you start learning how to actually tweak the probe to get your views um, when the patient's anatomy is a little bit less ideal. So normal view, um, here what we're seeing that's most important is that valve um, so we want to see the um, inflow tract from the left atrium to the left ventricle. We want to see the outflow tract through um, the aortic valve. Um, and most importantly, we want to see that squeeze in the left ventricle, and we want to see that valve slapping nicely up alongside um, the septum. Um, so just to identify the anatomy here, um, you've got your right ventricle on top, which typically you're not getting a great view of um, through this view, your left ventricle, your uh, left atrium and your, your aortic outflow tract. Um, important to point out here at the, uh, the sort of bottom of the, the image here, I don't know if I can bring the cursor over, I guess not. Oh, here we go. One sec. The, 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 the sort of the descending aorta here. So um, it sort of half shows up on the screen. Okay. The descending aorta in the back, and that's going to be important for a few reasons, which we'll point out in just a sec. So where is the fluid here? There's an effusion. I'll sort of give you that. How do you know it's pericardial? Because it's above the descending aorta. Correct. Correct. Very good. So I, I pulled these two images from uh, this website, which is actually pretty good, Descend, um, the ultrasoundoftheweek.com. Um, in this case, where do you think the fluid is? Now, keep in mind, this is now opposite screen, right? Yeah. This is a cardiology view. So, plural or, yeah, it's plural, right? So you've got uh, that web of fluid that's kind of coming in and below, oh, there you go, below the aorta. Um, so this is actually a plural effusion right up adjacent to the heart. Uh, and in this view, we've now got a, um, uh, Fusion that's actually above the aorta. So this again would be a pericardial effusion. So use that aorta to your advantage. In adults, they're going to be looking for you know things like the um, dissection of the aorta and you know the size and stuff like that. Obviously for us, sure. Like if you're really keen, look at that aorta. But there's probably not very often that you're going to be picking up much by looking at the appearance of it itself. It's just helpful in relation to fluid assessments. Um, what's going on here? He's not, he not giving a high five, so very, very poor function. So obviously your um, parasternal lung is your best view for, for looking at functional abnormalities of the heart. Just to sort of point out other things which will come up later, beelines Beeline. at the back. So perhaps this is a kid in failure. Um, and that, you know, that fluid could well be as part of either a SERS kind of thing versus, you know, being just from the actual CHF. Another example here of poor function. In this case, the uh, LV, which again, we don't really want to comment too much on anatomy, but it is, is probably relatively dilated. Um, so this is probably a dilated um, cardiomyopathy or something of that equivalent um, with poor function. Um, now, whether this patient's like at their baseline and they look like this, which some kids may well be, or if this is a kid who actually is coming in unwell, uh, no, this is not the last one. <laughs> These images are, I think, relatively old.